Hey, what's going on guys? It's Adam from Spiritus Systems. And we're out here shooting another Patrol Basics video for you. Today we're gonna to be talking about sleep in a non-permissive environment. If you think I should get up now, go ahead and uh, hit the like button. If you think I should take 10 more minutes, hit the snooze. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I think I'm just gonna actually take a couple more minutes. Today we're going to be focusing on non-permissive environments. Uh, the next video we'll do semi-permissive environments and the video after that we're going to do permissive environments. And the reason that we decided to break this into a couple different chunks is one to make it a little more digestible for you as the audience uh, and then also give a clear division between operational areas that a soldier or even a civilian in, in some kind of disaster scenario might be experiencing and, uh, and give you a good way to understand where you know, your equipment plugs in and maybe where it doesn't. Uh, but for today's video, we're going to be talking about non-permissive. So what does non-permissive mean? Uh, it means, you know, basically not allowing to do something, right? Or not allowing for something to be done. So when we use the word non-permissive, we mean uh, we're in an area that we can't do the thing that we want to do uh, as a military. So that could be uh, the weather could be non-permissive, the environment could be non-permissive, but generally we're talking about the enemy situation, right? Um, the enemy makes it a non-permissive environment. And this means that we're gonna have to make very clear choices on how we want to sleep, when we wanna sleep, and what tools we're gonna use to sleep. So sleep is a delicate subject, especially in the military. Uh, every soldier wants more of it, and every commander is trying to figure out how to give less of it to get the mission done. Uh, this creates kind of a flux between, you know, the lower enlisted guys and the upper echelon, because as the dude out on the line holding, you know, holding the line, you're tired all the time. There's a lot of work to be done and you're not getting a lot of sleep. As a commander, you're up there and you are trying to push the mission forward and you need the guys to perform. So for the longest time, the military would tell you you only needed four hours of sleep in a 24 hour cycle, which we know now through you know, medical science that four hours is just not sustainable for human, like human life. It's just not. You have guys who are operating on four hours of sleep and you start getting diminishing returns pretty quickly. Uh, a couple days into a four hours uh, sleep cycle per night, guys are gonna start falling asleep on guard. They're definitely gonna fall asleep if they're driving uh, it even gets to the point where if anybody here has been to ranger school or any army school, you are going to start even falling asleep while you're walking. Uh, plenty of times I've seen guys literally fall asleep when we short halt, just taking a knee, a guy will just fall asleep. That's not because he's a, you know, he's weak or anything like that. It's just biology. Your body is going to start forcing you to go to sleep the minute you become inactive because it needs that sleep. Uh, to do some very important repair work on your body at the cellular level. So it's going to demand and uh, sleep from you and you're basically just going to comply at any given time. Now the Army has you know, done all this research up until now and I think it's FM 7-22 states currently that eight to nine hours is the new standard for a soldier. So in a 24 hour cycle, in perfect conditions obviously, uh, you need eight to nine hours of sleep to perform at that optimal 100% uh, performance rate, right? I am gonna say it's for the guys who served in 1980 and you know all the dudes in the comments who are WWEing us every video, I'm gonna say it so you don't get mad. I understand and you should understand that the enemy has a vote in all of this and that sleep will never trump security, it just won't. You will always pull security before you sleep. You will always have security before you sleep. That's just the that's just how it is. It's how it has to be. Because sleep is useless if we're just all dead anyways, right? So you have to have that security up. And we are going to be talking about ways to get optimal sleep in suboptimal conditions. Because uh, the quality of sleep is almost just as important as getting sleep itself. So in these videos, you're gonna learn about the tools, some of the techniques, and uh, some ways to get that optimal sleep so that you can be at the best performance when the time comes. 
All right, guys, so let's get into it. Non-permissive environment, right? Let's, uh, let's set the context a little bit. Um, when we're in a non-permissive environment, I really want to iterate this so that guys don't get pissed off in the comments uh, thinking that we, we're telling young soldiers that they should just roll out everything and sleep uh, when they shouldn't be sleeping. So this video and the context of this video is, is non-permissive. Uh, we, we are going to default to the least amount of stuff that we could possibly use uh, every time, right? We do not want to be taking everything out and having a yard sale. We want to be, you know, packed up, ready to go at a moment's notice, ready to fight. With that being said, uh, site selection is very, very important, right? We are, uh, we're in a non-permissive environment. We need to be picking somewhere that has a lot of overhead cover if we can, uh, but also terrain that is inhospitable and somewhere that honestly we would not want to walk through uh, if we were on the opposite side, right? If we were the, the enemy in this scenario, we want to pick somewhere that we can bed down in that, you know, no one's going to find us and they aren't going to even care to come looking for us because it's so remote or so isolated uh, there. So the first thing I'm going to point out is something that uh, you might not expect, but if you're an infantryman, you probably expect. And that's your entrenching tool, right? Uh, this is something that uh, you should be taking with you uh, if you are on that conventional side of things. Uh, maybe not so much on the, on the small unit side, but definitely on the conventional side. And this guy enables us to change the terrain to uh, be able to get our bodies below the ground hidden from both uh, observation and from fire. So the E-Tool, the Ranger Grave, things like that, we're not gonna get into constructing a Ranger Grave, all that, but we will uh, show you kind of what it looks like. So the E-Tool is my first piece of equipment that uh, is gonna be included in my kit on my ruck to uh, prepare a sleeping position. As we scale up, right, with keeping in mind that my default if the temperature dictates, right? Everything I have here is dependent on the weather, right? Uh, if I can, I'm going to just sleep with my kit on, uh, I lean up against my rock or whatever, lay on the ground, and I'm just going to sleep with what I have on and I'm not gonna have to adjust my layers for the environment. But unfortunately, uh, the environment has a vote and the temperature is going to change or the weather conditions are gonna change and I'm not gonna have a choice. I'm going to have to seek some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of layering system or barrier to keep the weather or the temperature uh, off of me. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is just the top, right? I choose to wear a field top because I think there's more utility in a field top than a combat shirt. And this is one of the reasons why. Uh, when I stop and uh, I dry out, this thing is a little bit warmer than a combat shirt and I can use it in a couple different ways. I could actually drape it over my body more like a blanket and uh, keep some of that, that warmth in. So the field top is my first layer. Something like this schmock works really well as well. This is a British DPM schmock. Uh, it's a desert version. It's a little bit of a lighter material. But uh, anybody who's operated in a desert environment knows that the temperature variability is extreme. So having something like this, again, that I can wear, I can sleep in, and uh, if, it, if stuff pops off, I can quickly uh, either take it off or I can just wear it how it is and it's not a big deal. I'm not gonna overheat in it. So something like that is very good, very versatile. Uh, then moving up to kind of that inclement weather, um, wet weather gear is my go-to, right? So I have a set here, it's both a top and a bottom which I recommend if you're doing military operations, you should have both. Uh, there comes a point where the biology is just, uh, you, it's impossible to argue with. So we can't argue that guys should just suffer and lay out in freezing rain. Uh, they just will not make it. They, they will not survive the night if they get soaked and the temperature drops below 30 degrees. Guys are gonna start getting hypothermia and they're gonna, they're gonna die. Uh, so we have to let them get out of that, even if we're in a non-permissive environment. So wet weather gear is the way to do that, 
right? It's lightweight generally, it's uh, easy to pack and it's easy to get in and out of, uh, but it also creates that barrier from the elements. So wet weather gear for its weight is very warm because it is a semi-permeable fabric, but it's almost non-permeable. That's what makes it waterproof. So it creates a vapor barrier uh, and it is going to repel water, but it's also not gonna let a lot of uh, uh, vapor out of it either. So as you sweat and things like that, as you generate heat, it's going to stay inside that wet weather gear. If you've ever worn a raincoat and then done physical activity, uh, you've probably taken it off because you started to get really hot. Well, it's the same effect. So it's great for sleeping in inclement weather. The good thing about it is that you're ready to go immediately because you're just wearing clothing. There's nothing on top of you. You're not inside of a shelter. It's just what you have on. Uh, so always in my rucksack, both the top and a bottom. I do recommend uh, getting bottoms that are full zip, right? This, this way you can put them on without having to uh, take any of your other clothing off or your boots or anything like that. So full zip is the way to go because uh, you can get them on easily. It doesn't matter what, uh, where you get your wet weather gear, honestly. I, just, I recommend surplus for this because the military actually has pretty decent uh, Gore-Tex wet weather gear. Uh, so the Marine Corps, the Army, their issued equipment from a surplus store is going to work really well. You can get something very high end like Sitka or whatever that's going to work too, but the price differential is, is uh, quite high being in that almost a thousand dollar range for uh, a jacket and some pants if they're on sale. So you're looking at spending a lot of money for wet weather gear when you could just go to the surplus store, honestly, and buy something. Another th penalty on wet weather gear is this one's kind of burly. This is uh, this this stuff is bomb proof. It can rain and rain and rain and you're just not going to get wet. I would prefer for combat operations to have a lighter weight set, to be uh, completely honest. So the wet weather gear is there. The next uh, kind of barrier we have and something that I do not patrol without. So all, with all of this equipment that we're showing you, it's up to you to know contextually how you would apply it uh, in the environment that you're in because I can't paint every environment for you. Just remember, uh, like I said before, uh, sleep and your comfort does not trump security, right? So you have to use the right tools at the right time. Uh, but you, you do have to survive the night. So always keep that in mind. But this is something that I keep with me uh, no matter what. It's always in my patrol gear. That is the poncho, right? This is a, uh, a non-negotiable for me because it can cover my body, but it can also cover my equipment and keep things dry in that military context. I can use it for other things like a litter, stuff like that. So it's very versatile, always in my pack. Um, but it is a poncho. So I can put it on like a poncho. I can throw it over my rucksack. If it's just torrential downpour, but we're still moving, I can actually throw it on and, and walk with it on. Uh, but in the context of sleep, I like it because I can pull this out of an external pouch. I can drape it over my entire body and all my equipment. And if it's raining, I'm still staying dry. Right? So half of the battle with the weather is just keeping yourself dry right? And that's where the poncho comes in. It's great. Can make shelters out of it. Can use it as a ground cloth like we're doing here as well. Um, so yeah, the poncho is, uh, is absolutely something I would invest in. Now the military issued poncho is not bad. I th personally think the Marine Corps has done a better job with the poncho than the army. Uh, it's actually not a poncho. They, they have a tarp if I'm not mistaken. And that tarp is thicker. It's a little heavier, but it really, really works great for a shelter uh, or to drape over equipment because it is bigger and it's a little more burly. I think it's worth the weight penalty. This one right here is an aftermarket version. Uh, Kevin, who makes this one? Bushcraft Outfitters. Uh, Bushcraft Outfitters. So we'll just give them a little call out. It's really high quality. Uh, it's a good poncho. It snaps together. You can wear it in some different configurations. So uh, I really recommend this guy. No matter what I'm doing, that's, that's coming with me uh, because it is just so versatile. So we're starting to move up in some of the thermal uh, layering stuff. Again, it's biology, guys. Anyone can argue that you're out on patrol, you shouldn't have any of this stuff, and it just doesn't hold weight when you're in that cold weather environment. So 
they can argue in the comments, but, but we're gonna show you some stuff that even in a non-permissive environment, you might have to have dependent on how cold the operating environment is. And this one is everyone's favorite, America's favorite, the Whoopi. This one is uh, not the issued Whoopi. This is a aftermarket Whoopi. I used uh, this model, an older one, I actually have it here as well, but this one uh, in Afghanistan for many years, it is a monofilament synthetic fill. So this fill is not going to lose its uh, insulating properties if it's if it's damp or wet um, and it's monofilament which means that there doesn't have to be any quilting on this right so what quilting does is it puts a stitch line to hold that filament in place um, without quilting you don't have any cold spots right this thing is a beast uh, it's very lightweight and uh, i like it because again i can just drape it over my body and then just like the poncho if something happens i can throw it off and i'm ready to fight immediately I can wear, it's not like a sleeping bag that I have to get inside and zip up. Uh, that is, you know, something I would never want to do in a non-permissive environment uh, is put myself into a bag that I can't get out of. So this, you know, is great because I can put it over and then I can throw it off uh, if I need to at a moment's notice. So the Whoopi, uh, again, something that oftentimes finds its way into my uh, patrol gear because it is so versatile and lightweight. Uh, so that's the next level there. Another piece that pretty much is always on my ruck uh, when I was in Afghanistan, and you know, not every environment I was in in Afghanistan was non-permissive, but it certainly was uh, quite often. And the sleep pad, or more affectionately known as the puss pad, if you're serving, is, uh, is a piece of equipment that I think everybody should have. Uh, the disparaging name comes from the mentality that if you use a sleep mat that you are uh, a weak person or whatever, which I just don't find to be true. Again, when we just look at the truth behind thermodynamics and how bodies transfer heat, uh, we know that the earth is bigger than uh, the average human being. It may not, your mom may not have a problem sleeping right on the ground because she's massive, but everyone else has a problem, right? A smaller body, is gonna transfer the heat to that larger body. It's good. That larger body is gonna suck the heat from you, uh, which again, in a warmer environment, if you're in a tropical environment, you're not gonna need this. If you are in uh, a colder environment, even out here in North Carolina this morning, it's you know 40 degrees now, but it was 30 something degrees earlier, you will go hypothermic just from laying straight on the ground. So you need this thermal barrier. And all this is doing is it's creating an air pocket between you and the ground, right? It's making it harder for the ground to absorb that heat. Uh, this one is a Thermarest. This is again, the one I used for many years in Afghanistan. I like it because it's extra wide. Uh, and again, that site selection, right? Looking for uh, somewhere to lay down. I'm gonna find the, the flattest spot I can. I'm gonna try to use this if the situation dictates, uh, but I can also just sit on this, right? I can literally take this in the rolled up form and just sit on it to keep myself up off the ground, lean against my rucksack, go to sleep that way. Uh, very versatile tool. Uh, I cut it down for my length. I'm not very tall, so I don't need a seven foot sleep mat. Uh, so you can cut you know pieces off it. It's closed cell foam, which means that unlike the issued army sleep pad, bugs are not gonna get inside of it like sand fleas and stuff like that. We also have the Marine Corps issued version here. Thanks, Kevin. Um, this one is great because it's an accordion, right? Uh, I like the accordion design because of speed. It also has the ties built into it to keep it nice and tidy. So you're not uh, fighting with it all the time. It's all built into it. Again, the Marine Corps totally uh, owning us on equipment selection, which, uh, you know, whatever is what it is. So sleep pads, I think they're important. Again, contextually, if I think I'm gonna get attacked, probably not going to deploy the sleep pad uh, but if it is one of those things where we're just in that environment but we're undetected and we're somewhere where we think we can pull them out absolutely going to tell guys to use it and contextually again if it's very very cold and we're up north we're probably going to have to use it we're not going to have a choice so that's the things you have to keep in mind is that we're showing you all these tools but it's up to you to select when to use them and when not to use them so getting up into the, the, the big boy thermals, 
right? Again, this is stuff that may be non-negotiable dependent on the environment you're in. So here in North Carolina right now, where it's, uh, again, it's 30 to 40 degrees in the morning, probably not gonna bring this with me. Uh, it's just too, too much weight, too much bulk, and the temperature is just not there for me to need this. Now, if we go up further, if you're in, say, Alaska, and you're out on patrol in a non-permissive environment, you're gonna have to have some stuff like this. There's just no choice. The good news is that whoever your opponent is, is also gonna have to have these tools. They're also gonna have to follow the same weather rules as you. So you have that going for you. But things like the sleep pad, the poncho liner, all of that's gonna find its way into my rucksack if I'm in that cold weather environment. So this is just the level seven parka. I like it because uh, it's a garment I can wear when I'm, say I'm pulling sentry duty or something like that. Um, I can wear it while on guard, but I can easily take it off if a fight starts. So I'm not overheating. It's very long, so I can sleep in it. And that's where, you know, this video talking about sleep, using this as a sleeping garment, almost like a sleeping bag, right? I get all those benefits of being wrapped in something that has high loft in it. I can zip it up, I can put the hood up, and I can kind of cocoon inside of it. And it's so long, especially on somebody who is shorter like me, I really can get almost my entire body inside of that garment. Uh, we also have a, a Outdoor Research uh, Colossus parka. Same kind of theory, but this one's a little, it gets cut to be more like a coat, but still you can put this on, wrap up in it. I like that again, you can just unzip it and take it off. So we're sleeping, we're nice and warm. Oh no, we're getting attacked. Just rip it off and throw it on the ground and, and fight. So those are two great options, more traditional coat options. Uh, Kevin was kind enough to loan us some of his Hill People Gear uh, Mountain Serapes, which I think is a great option, something that I had seen before, but I have never really, I had never really used. Uh, but these things are awesome. And the reason why they're awesome is that they're a poncho. That's a whoopee. That's a poncho, but could also be a whoopee again. So you can use this, uh, you know, you say you're on guard, you can throw it on and now you have your body, you're kind of in that thermal layer, but you can easily just pull the whole thing off your body and get right into the fight. And then say you're off guard now and you're going back behind the line, um, you can turn this into basically a sleeping bag and you can get inside of it and, and sleep inside of it. And it comes in two sizes. There's a, there's a large and kind of this medium size. So you have, or a large and a small, I guess. Uh, one is gonna come more closer to your hips. The other one's gonna drape closer to your knees depending on your height, obviously. Uh, so if you want one that isn't quite as long, you can, you can have that. Uh, great garments, and, a, and honestly, the theory is there for me, having something that I can wear, but then I can also use as, a, as part of the sleep system as well, if the situation permits uh, there. And then uh, the rucksack. So something that people might not really consider to be part of the sleep system, but I do. Uh, I like the Alice pack uh, for patrolling because it's just a beast really in every aspect. But for sleep, I like it because one, I can use the frame uh, to drape my poncho over uh, my body and create kind of an air pocket over my face. So I can put my poncho over, it's raining. It'll help shed some of that rain away from my body and keep me dry. Um, I can use my hip belt as a pillow, right? So if this is propped up, I put my head here, have that poncho draped over it, and I'm sitting pretty good. If you add in the sleep pad, you got kind of this nice, uh, you know, sleep setup, like almost like a tent, but something that I can get off immediately uh, if I need to. I also like it because it gives me access to my uh, essential kind of rain gear poncho items on the outside of the bag without opening it. Uh, so I have my poncho in the center, my pants on one side, and my top, my rain top on the other side which uh, makes it very easy for me to pull that stuff out, get into it, and then put it back in without having to make a lot of noise or uh, move, uh, do a lot of movement. So that's the, the rucksack, an important and hardy piece of the sleep system. And I always forget this piece. I don't know where I put it. All right, all right, all right, found it, found it. All right, we got it. <laughs> One last thing I wanna talk about. I will not shut up about the bug net. I refuse to be silenced. Mosquitoes everywhere hate this one trick. So 
when we think of sleep gear, everybody thinks of blankets and sleeping bags and, you know, pillows and things like that. Um, I think of the bug net, right? If you've ever been uh, somewhere where there's a lot of bugs, nothing will prevent you from getting a good night's sleep uh, than bugs literally attacking your face the entire night. So just a simple, you can go to REI or whatever, Moose Jaw, you can go there, you can buy a bug net. It's a head net, right? It goes over your head and you can put this on in a, in a warmer climate and it's no big deal. It's not gonna prevent you from doing your job. It's not gonna make you slower at doing anything, but it will keep insects off your face, which if you're in a swamp and you just gotta lean up against a tree and, and catch some Zs, you just throw the bug net on over your, uh, over your head and put some gloves on and you're good to go. You have your field top on, you're not gonna get eaten alive by, by bugs all night. All right guys, so we talked about equipment. Uh, now we're gonna talk about kind of a site selection and just some considerations for your sleep area. So in this scenario, we're just gonna say that we have security pushed out and uh, you are one of the lucky chosen few who are, have been told to you know, go establish a little bit of a, of a sleep area and bed down so that you can then uh, initiate your rest plan and uh, start the guard rotation. So we have security out, so keep that in mind. Now, to touch on though, if, if we we're in a small unit and there, weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of manpower, uh, again, we're gonna revert back to that I'm leaning against my ruck, I'm leaning against another guy, I'm not taking anything out and I'm just sleeping in what I'm wearing. Uh, I'm doing the minimalist approach that I can, but you guys don't need a video on how to lay flat on the ground and wear all, you know, wear all your kit and go to sleep. That, that is that uh, most austere, most non-permissive environment kind of uh, footprint that we would be leaving. So now we're still in that non-permissive environment, but we do have security kicked out and you might be in this uh, non-permissive environment for months. So you're gonna have to sleep at some point. Uh, so a couple of considerations. One, are we going to take our kit off? Are we gonna take our helmet off? Are we gonna take our chest rig or our plate carrier off? Are we gonna take our boots off? Things like that. Those are all contextual questions. Uh, I will tell you, if I feel at all like there is any contact that could be imminent, I am not taking my boots off. I'm sleeping in my, you know, in everything I have. Uh, I'm keeping it on because at a, I want to be able to wake up and go at a moment's notice. Uh, but eventually, even then, guys are going to have to take their boots off. Uh, I just recommend that maybe sleeping is not the best time to do that. Uh, chest rigs, helmets, weapons, right? Again, contextually, if I feel like a fight's coming, I'm, you know, I'm going to be wearing my stuff. But again, you're not going to get as good a sleep. So if there's, if there's any margin of safety, I'm going to take my chest rig off, take my helmet off, uh, and I'm gonna place those to the side of my sleep area. Now, those items are going to be placed in the same spot every time that I uh, go to bed, right? Every time I set up a sleep area, I'm going to choose very deliberately how my chest rig is, where my weapon is, where my helmet is. That way, it's repeatable and it's the same every time. Uh, that way, if I'm startled awake, I grab those two things and I can go. As for my helmet, um, I actually strap my chin strap to the chest rig so that I can grab just the chest rig and just my rifle and I can, uh, I can get out of there. Uh, another thing that I wanna talk about is the tidiness of your sleep area. So you wanna have only the items out of your rucksack that you are using. Everything else gets packed back inside the rucksack and your rucksack gets closed and all everything tightened down and ready to go. Uh, the reason being that if you are startled awake and we have to you know, get out of here with the break contact, you might be leaving behind a sleep pad. You might leave behind your, your whoopee or your puff top or something, but you have everything else that you can grab it and you can leave. Uh, so keeping a tidy area is, is very important. Um, another thing that you might consider doing is a technique called hot swapping. Uh, hot swapping is very, very effective because you essentially take, you know, one to however many guys and you combine your sleeping equipment uh, for those who are sleeping and then those that are on watch don't have that equipment, right? So if you can imagine if there were two of me here and then there were two put, you know, sleep pads, there were two 
whoobies, then when one guy was on guard and the other guy sleeping, he now has double the sleep equipment, uh, you know, that he, he's utilizing. So he's warmer and more comfortable. Uh, a little story. So in Afghanistan, at the very beginning of a mission, a very long 45 day uh, operation in the mountains, I was hot swapping with another guy. And in the middle of the night, he had rolled off of my sleep pad uh, and a helicopter came in to drop off supplies and it blew my poncho and my sleep pad off the mountain. Uh, never to be seen again. I actually got charged for it later on when I was leaving the army. But uh, the point of that story is that keeping a tidy area and making sure your stuff is secure is very important and very practical. It's not always gonna be an emergency that uh, takes your stuff away. It may just be the wind. And all of a sudden you don't have a, a poncho anymore. Um, another consideration is if you are a specialty troop, if you have a machine gun or a mortar tube or any specialized equipment, uh, you are gonna have to be securing that equipment possibly on the line uh, or at your sleep uh, site with a poncho, right? So whenever I had a machine gun or anything like that, I would actually carry two ponchos. I mean, one of them would be sacrificed for the machine gun and the other one would be part of my uh, sleep kit. So the whole point of site selection is looking for the most comfortable place that you can find within the left and right limits of security, right? So, you know, it may just be a rock pile. You may not have a choice. It may be uneven terrain, but if I have a choice, I'm going to pick somewhere that is relatively comfortable. I'm going to try to find some piece like this tree right here. Uh, I'm going to some piece of terrain that I can, you know, conceal my body, uh, really cover and concealment. If I can find cover, great. If not, just concealment. That way, again, if I'm startled awake, I have something that I can maneuver around to fight around. Uh, the worst case scenario is that you are asleep and then you get attacked and you have to wake up and try to orient towards what's going on, uh, potentially reinforce the line or fight in place. So I always want to have some kind of terrain feature to, to support me, you know, if I can. If I, if the uh, situation dictates, I'm going to pull my e-tool out and I'm going to dig a hole and uh, also known as a ranger grave, approximately my height and width and deep enough to get me off of a flat surface, a technique that we uh, use heavily in flat terrain. Or if, you're, uh, if your primary non-permissive concern is artillery, you wanna get yourself below the ground so that you're not taking uh, shrapnel while you're sleeping. And one last consideration is to uh, let the, you know, the guards know where your position is, your sleeping position. You should be consolidated with the rest of the guys who are uh, sleeping or the guys that are coordinated to be on your fighting position. You should be consolidated so that the guard can come and he can wake you up in order uh, of guard watch. And also, if you are the guard, take into consideration that you are in a non-permissive environment. And maybe when you wake people up, you choose uh, you know, kind of a light method of waking them up uh, instead of startling them awake. I mean, it is a bunch of 18 year olds with machine guns after all. So you should, uh, you should consider that they might be a little afraid. And if you kick them awake, you might not get the response that, that you want there. So yeah, guys, that's site selection. And uh, those are just some tips to help you pick somewhere comfortable and to maximize the amount of sleep you're getting and the quality of sleep that you're getting while still maintaining that security posture needed to fight at a moment's notice. So, all right, guys, that concludes this video, this segment. Uh, tune into the channel because like I said, there's gonna be a couple of these videos on sleep. Uh, Non-permissive is kind of a weird one, right? Because the technique really is sleeping on the ground uh, and, bare, and using the, you know, the minimum amount of equipment that you can. Uh, so, you know, tell us what you think in the comments. See if we missed anything. Tell us your techniques. And uh, as always, I appreciate you guys taking the time to, to watch. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> All right, guys. So every video, I'm prob I probably will always forget something. And a very critical part of your non-permissive sleep system is the beanie cap or the watch cap and gloves. Uh, again, if you're gonna have to be spending the night out, something I always carry with me is the watch cap and a set of nice gloves. 
So if you've made it all the way to this point in the video, all the way to the very end, you get the little extra nugget that nobody else got. And we appreciate you for uh, sticking around.